Hi, my name is Ed Cashman. I'm in the Standard Plans Group, and today I'm going to be discussing some updates that are being made to FDM 240. Hi, everyone. This is Mary O'Brien. I'm the State Bicycle Pedestrian Coordinator here in Central Office in the Criteria section of the Roadway Design Office. And today I'm going to be going over the changes in the FDM 240 Transportation Management Plan that pertain to bicycle and pedestrian changes. So I would just like to preface this by saying that there were a considerable number of changes that were made to FDM 240, more than I could possibly cover in this webinar. So I will be touching on some of the major changes or items that were not previously covered in FDM 240. So looking at the first one here with the TTC plan phase submittals, this is from the 2019 FDM, and it was 240.4.3. This item is still going to exist. However, it will be moving to FDM 321. And this is the 2020 FDM showing 321.2 with the TTCP submittals. It's the same information that was previously in 240. Moving on to lane width, this is from the 2019 FDM 240.4.2.6, and these lane widths are not changing. However, the actual requirements for the lanes are going to be housed in the standard specification section 102, and there will just be a link pointing to section 102 for the 2020 FDM, but the lane widths and the requirements still exist. Lane closure analysis. This is the 2019 FDM excerpt from 240.4.2.7. This is requiring that a eight hour period is provided for contractors when they're going to be utilizing a lane closure. Actually having the eight hour period is still required in the 2020 FDM. However, the language has changed in an attempt to make it clear that the eight hour period is really required for the work that is supposed to be covered in there. So if a double lane closure was necessary to perform the work, that eight hour period should include the double lane closure. It shouldn't be starting from just the single lane and then moving to the double lane. Also, we did add some additional language in here regarding one eight-hour period per 24-hour work period. Traffic pacing. So this is coming from the 2019 FDM. The actual sub-article in here is fairly lengthy. However, a lot of this information is not necessary in this part of the FDM. So the 2020 FDM will have a much reduced section in here that really just points designers to FDM 242. The actual standard plans also still have a traffic pacing index. So between what's in the index and 242, that covers a lot of what was previously kind of spread out amongst multiple documents. And there will be an additional webinar that covers 242 and changes that are being made in that section. Project information signs. The 2019 FDM has the old 90-day requirement in here. That is being updated to a much lengthier period before requiring a project information sign. So from the 2020 FDM excerpt from 240.2.2.1, the project information sign will now only be required for projects with a construction contract time of more than 730 days. So that should eliminate the use of project information signs on a considerable number of projects. The other requirements are still the same at this time. Pedestrian longitudinal channelizing devices. The 2019 FDM excerpt from 240.4.2.4 was requiring that pedestrian longitudinal channelizing devices be used on basically all temporary pedestrian ways. However, in the 2020 FDM, the pedestrian longitudinal channelizing devices are only required along both sides of a temporary pedestrian way if there is no 
temporary barrier being used or an existing barrier. If there is an existing barrier or temporary barrier on one side of the temporary pedestrian way or both sides, a pedestrian longitudinal channelizing device is not required to be placed alongside it or to be along that side of the temporary pedestrian way. And that's shown here in this bottom bullet. Motorist awareness system or the MOS had some somewhat unclear requirements for use, particularly looking at number three here, a lane closure is required for more than five days consecutive or not. The intention behind this requirement was that the MOS would essentially be used on all multi-lane facilities that are construction projects. The, the five days consecutive or not was intended to eliminate its use on maintenance work. So moving forward with the 2020 FDM, it's been simplified to just require that the MOS is used for construction projects on multi-lane divided roadways with lane closures and impose a speed of 55 miles per hour or greater. Uh, temporary raised rumble strips. The previous requirements for the temporary raised rumble strips were in the 2019-2020 standard plans index 102-603. And the requirements have always been located in 603. However, moving forward, the speed limit requirement is going to be moving into the FDM. So in the 2020 FDM, in subarticle 240.2.2.13, the requirement to use the temporary raised rumble strips are now housed in the FDM. So that means that designers need to ensure that they do specify the usage in their plan set. And that would just be via a note. It doesn't need to be shown necessarily in some kind of a phasing plan, just as long as it is clear where the temporary raised rumble strips are to be used. Also, additionally, there is an option to use the temporary raised rumble strips on multi-lane roadways, and that is shown here in this the second portion of this article. So the requirement is the same, that it would just be conveyed to the contractor in some way that the temporary raised rumble strips are to be used on a particular roadway. And for any questions or comments on this, please feel free to contact me and I will do my best to answer your questions. Hi everyone, this is Mary O'Brien. We did have quite a few changes for 2020 that pertain to bicycle and pedestrian and we're really excited to share them with you today. We were looking at international and national best practices including the Crow Manual. Um, that's what they use in the Netherlands and they have a lot of really good outcomes there with bicyclists and we're hoping we'll see the same here. And we also looked at pedestrians, of course. We basically redid the whole section on the bicycle and pedestrian section, but I'm not going to go through every element. I'm going to hit on a lot of the details, but we're not gonna go through it in its entirety. Okay, so we added new language to address the Florida National Scenic Trail and the Sun Trail. The exact language says we're going to provide accommodations on Florida National Scenic Trails and Sun Trails. We also went over an outline of basic principles. The way that reads is we're going to minimize impacts to existing bicycle, pedestrian, and transit facilities by preserving the following to the extent feasible. Safety features, connectivity of the facilities to and through the project, and directness of the routes. Also, we said that we're gonna incorporate the following requirements into the temporary traffic control plan. The design principles for temporary bicycle and pedestrian facilities, and also the location of temporary routes for pedestrians and bicyclists. So first of all, I'll go over some of those design principles. One of them is we talk about providing like-for-like -like facilities. Provide like-for-like -like bicycle and pedestrian facilities to the maximum extent possible. When this cannot be accomplished for bicycle facilities, separate motorized traffic from bicycle traffic whenever possible. 
the higher the volumes of motorized traffic or percentage of truck traffic and the longer the duration of construction, the more substantial the separation should be. Specify temporary bicycle ways that replicate the geometric characteristics of the existing bicycle way. For example, a separated bicycle facility should remain separated during construction. See FDM 223.2.5 for more information. So we specifically want this information to be in there because as we move towards more separated bicycle facilities, it's gonna be really important that we keep our design user in mind. And if in the past it's been a separated facility, we don't wanna all of a sudden have them in a shared lane condition if possible. Also, we talk about phasing the construction plans phase the construction plans to ensure bicycle and pedestrian facilities are only closed when necessary. See FDM 321 for more information. And then next we go over location. We talk about acceptable detour distances for pedestrians and people bicycling. Keep detour lengths and diversions as short as practicable. Detours should not create more than a 30% increase in the length of the non-motorized facility or not longer than a half a mile for bicyclists or a quarter mile for pedestrians. To minimize the detour length, consider providing a temporary mid-block crosswalk instead of detouring pedestrians to the nearest signalized intersection or existing crosswalk. So this is guidance that we've been wanting to move towards for a while now, so we're excited to be able to provide a little bit more structure on this item. We also go over the order of preference for types of detour routes. The order of preference for routing is to, first of all, maintain the facility on the same side of the road. If you can't do that, then a diversion to the opposite side of the road and return to the original side of the road as soon as possible. And if you can't do that, then detour to another road, return to original road and side of road as soon as possible. Within that, we talk about people biking onto pedestrian facilities. If the existing bicycle facility is a shared use path or separated bike lane and separation for bicyclists, such as a temporary bike lane is not possible, then bicyclists may be directed onto the temporary pedestrian way of a minimum width of eight feet. So this is different from what we had in the past. In the past, we had specified not to put bicyclists onto a pedestrian facility, but now as we're moving towards more separated bicycle facilities, we're seeing that this might be the most appropriate thing in certain circumstances. Also, we wanna communicate detours to all road users. So provide portable changeable message signs letting motorists know bicyclists will be detoured onto the road per FDM 243. For example, bicycle facility closed, bicycles on road, bike detour ahead, bicycles on road. We also might wanna provide extra communication if there's gonna be additional crossings. So we could also provide portable changeable message signs to let folks know that there would be extra pedestrian or bicycle crossings. And so we give some examples of what that might look like. Next, we wanna make sure with the communication that we're coordinating with the owner of the facility, pedestrians or bicyclists will be detoured onto. And then again, this is just talking about if there's gonna be additional crossings or a shared lane condition that we wanna make sure that everyone is aware because motorists may not be aware of the construction project that has caused the need for rerouting. And so these are some examples of what those messages might look like. And that is everything. And for any questions or comments on this, please feel free to contact. This is Mary O'Brien. Thank you very much.